Welcome to Why Did I Fail That Test? This video was developed after years of working with students one-on-one -on -one after they failed exams. And I noticed common set of patterns of why people failed exams. And so in my other video about test taking tips, I gave just some of those general tips. But the reality is if you fail an exam, you usually have a problem with one particular part of test taking, maybe two, but it's usually one or two things. And if you can fix those particular things that are specific to you, then you can raise your test scores by 10, 10 points easily and keep them that way. Uh, so that's why this video was created. I created Pocket Prof Nursing because I know how hard it is for students to get what they need from all teachers. We don't intend to replace your professors, but we hope to provide additional resources and different perspectives to help deepen your understanding of the material in your classes. Okay, so the process that I use with students is as follows. And if at all possible, have someone help you do this. It's really easy to ignore or dismiss your own mistakes. And so what I want you to do is to sit down with your exam and really analyze. And when I do this with students, I have them um, schedule one hour with me. And the first thing I ask them is, do you know what you did wrong on this exam? And if they say, yeah, I didn't study, I didn't do well at all, then I expect to see mostly knowledge problems. However, if they say, no, I have no idea, I studied hard, I thought I was prepared, I felt good after taking the exam, so I have no idea what happened, that's when we really sit down and use this process so we can try to figure out what it is because I, I believe that you study. What I have found, though, is that oftentimes students don't study appropriately. Particularly, they don't study based on their learning style. So if that's if you find that might be your problem, then I would encourage you to watch the video on learning styles, too. So first, ask yourself if you know what you did wrong on the exam. And then as soon as possible, make an appointment to look at your exam. The sooner you do this after taking the test, the better, because your memory is still clear as to what you were thinking on the exam. So what you're going to do is you're going to read through every question you missed and try to remember what you were thinking at you, the time you took the exam. Um, so things like, I knew that answer. I knew it was this one. So it's maybe you didn't finish reading that or well I had it down to these two and then I picked the wrong one or um, I was thinking well if I did this or if the patient had this that's how you need to think don't try to think oh yeah I know what it is now try to think what you were thinking at the time see why this is easier if someone does it with you but your instructor may or may not be able to do that and so um, try to do this on your own. Um, and then when you identify the test taking mistakes that you're making that I'll show you throughout the rest of this video, but when you identify that test taking mistake, write it beside each question because you're not going to make everyone the same. You're, I expect on a 50 question exam to see four or five knowledge questions. And so some of them will be knowledge, some of them will be carelessness or, oh man, I missed this one question, I didn't read it carefully, and then others may be down to two. So just write it out to the side. So I always use a different color pen, maybe a green pen or a red pen, and write out to the side the mistake that you make. Because what I want you to do when you read through the whole exam and figure out your mistakes, I want you to look at, man, did you um, change your answer on six questions? Because a lot of times you don't realize how often you make the same mistake over and over. So these are a common test taking mistakes that we see and so I've just listed them here but I'm going to cover each one of them in detail. So knowledge. The, the real problem with knowledge is you just don't know the answer. And you know what? A 
again, on a 50 point exam, 50 question exam, it's really only a real problem if you have more than four or five of these knowledge questions because we don't expect you to remember everything. We don't expect you to get them all right. And so I, I'm not freaked out if you miss four to five. If you miss more than that, then it is either because you didn't study well enough and maybe you know it or maybe you didn't know that or maybe you studied really hard and so it's really frustrating that you had these knowledge answer knowledge problems but maybe it's that you're really not studying appropriately so knowledge again you have to be very very honest with yourself when you sit down and look at these test taking mistakes you might have made was it knowledge or was it something else and so if they're all knowledge then and you studied as well as you thought you could have, then probably you need to change your studying by figuring out your learning style and then making your studying reflect that. So watch my video on learning style if this is your primary problem. Distractors. All nursing exams have distractor answers. These are really designed to make you say, Oh man, I remember talking about that, but I just don't really remember what it is. Thus, it distracts you from the correct answer. Most of the time, a distractor problem is really a knowledge problem. So you really don't get caught by distractors if you know your material, your material well. Occasionally, though, a distractor problem is a lack of confidence issue. Um, so you know you're doing this problem if you picked an answer because you remember talking about it sometime in class but you weren't completely sure what it was so you said mm, gosh I know we talked about that that must be the answer so these are kind of hard for you personally to identify but in a good instructor it'll be very easy to identify if you're getting caught by distractors the solution because this is oftentimes a knowledge problem is knowledge so you got to go back and study in a more appropriate way. However, if this is a frequent problem for you, it may help for you to cover up your answers. Read the question, circle keywords, and then write what you think the answer is or any information you remember about the subject. Then look at the answer choices. So what really happens when you do that is it focuses you to remember what you do know about the subject. So instead of getting caught by distractors, if you'll write what you know and then see if your answer is there, then you can mark off those distractors. And I'm going to give you an example of that on this next slide. So here's an example. The nurse is planning to administer furosemide or Lasix to a patient who is also taking digoxin. Which of the following should be checked before administration of the furosemide or Lasix? So, using the steps that I just taught you, you're going to circle the key words. So, that would be Lasix and digoxin, and then before administration of the Lasix. So circling keywords keep you very focused on what the question is really asking you. Now, handwrite what you know. And I've got some examples here. Okay, for Lasix, you know Lasix lowers potassium. You know that potassium has something to do with digoxin. Most people know that. You might remember that it increases the risk of digitoxicity. And then maybe since it asks about Lasix, you know Lasix causes dehydration. So what you're doing is you're writing everything you can think about about what this question is asking. So before you ever look at those answers, keeping yourself focused. So now the answers. Check the heart rate. Check the potassium level. Check for signs of bleeding. Check for level of consciousness. Okay, so right away you need to mark off signs of bleeding and level of consciousness. And really you need to mark off heart rate. So what happens, and this is a great example of distractors, what happens is you know that when you give digoxin you must check the heart rate before you give it. But this question is not asking you about giving digoxin. Look at what you circled. You circled Lasix before giving Lasix. You didn't write anything in your notes about heart rate. You just wrote about potassium. So that 
directly lead you to the answer of potassium level. Reading into the question, this is also another very common mistake people say. The bad news about this problem is it really requires self-discipline. You have to recognize you're doing it and then stop yourself. So the problem, the way you know you're doing this is you hear yourself saying, well, or if the patient also had but maybe they had this. Well, I remember when a patient I had had this. Maybe this. So anytime you say those words, you are reading into the question. You are adding things that weren't in the question to begin with. And so now you're making the question something it wasn't even asking. So what you have to do, if this is a constant problem for, for you, is you have to stop yourself. I give students that have this problem a little stop sign and we put it in front of them during the test you have to recognize you're doing this and stop yourself so when you hear in your head yourself saying well if but maybe those words up there stop go back reread that question circle the keywords like we did in that previous example those keywords will keep you focused and will keep you from adding something that wasn't already there in that question excuse me let me back up here down to two answers again a very common problem well you know we talked about in the test taking tips that for nursing um, test we always have at least two answers that are correct and you got to pick the right the right one and lots of students say I always get it down to two but then I never seem to pick the correct one stop looking at the question when you do this what happens is you keep reading it over and over and over and it, that doesn't really help you so stop circle circle this question so you know you need to come back to it finish the rest of your exam and then come back sometimes when you are doing the rest of your exam you'll get some you'll see something that will trigger you and you'll remember this question and you can answer it better when you come back however when you come back to it so you've done the whole entire exam you've come back cover up the answers read the question circle those keywords Write what you think about the answer, just like we did on the distractors and anything you remember about this subject. The difference here is now you're going to look at your answer choices. You may only choose an answer you have written. You may not consider any other options. That's the problem. When you look at those options, you start going, oh, maybe it's this, and I hadn't thought about that. That must be it. And so you've got to not do that. You've already had your chance to read this question and consider everything once before. You cannot do that the second time around. And then if both of your written answers are, are one of the options, then you're going to think about which of the two of those is worse. So I'm going to give you an example of this. A 20-year-old athlete presents for a routine physical with a heart rate of 48 and a blood pressure of 118 over 82. What should you do? Now we're going to circle the key answers. And the truth is all we're doing here is making you think about the answer before you ever see any choices. That way you aren't distracted and choosing something that's there just because it's there. You're going to think about what do I really know. So, 20-year-old athlete, anytime it says an age, the age should be significant. Heart rate of 48, blood pressure of 118 over 82. And I would even draw a little line, like the heart rate is low, the blood pressure is normal. Write that out beside it, again, keeping you focused. Now, what are you going to do? So now you need to sit and write what you know. So you know that an athlete with a low heart rate is expected. Not at all uncommon to have a low heart rate. And then you look at the blood pressure, that blood pressure is normal. So probably you need to do nothing at all. You don't need to do give them any drugs now. You might remember that bradycardia, one of the things we worry about is, it, is there any history of dizziness or fainting. If you remember that, then you're going to write that down. So 
Not uncommon for athletes to have a low heart rate, blood pressure is good, do nothing, any history of fainting. You think of anything else, you write it down. Now here's our options. Nothing. This is an expected finding. Ask about any history of chest pain. You don't have that written down, so you cannot choose it. Obtain an EKG. Again, you don't have that written down. You cannot choose it. Mark it off. Prepare to give atropine. Again, you don't have that, so mark it off. That clearly leads you to the answer of nothing. This is an expected finding. Now, if one of your answers was also, one of your choices was also ask the patient about any history of fainting, then you have two choices there that you also had written down. But think about that. Do nothing or, or obtain more assessment data? That makes sense. Now, history of chest pain, that really is a distractor. Chest pain doesn't really matter with bradycardia. It's that fainting and dizziness that we worry about. So that is not a choice, not an answer that you would choose. I'm giving you another example here. Your patient's had a stroke and has difficulty swallowing. Which of the following nursing diagnoses is a priority? So again, you're going to circle your key words. Stroke difficulty swallowing, and then nursing diagnoses. Why that's important is because especially on NCLEX, sometimes they'll ask you questions like, what do you expect the, excuse me, the medical intervention to be? So noting that it's a nursing diagnosis is really important because if it was medical, this would be a totally different answer. All right, we're writing our what we know again. So with stroke, difficulty swallowing, we definitely have to think about aspiration as a possibility. Weakness would be a possibility for stroke, physical mobility, eating problems, speech problems. See, I didn't put anything about true nursing diagnoses. I just wrote, what did I think about with a patient with a stroke and difficulty swallowing? Those might be some issues and really speech problems probably shouldn't be on there because it doesn't say anything about that. But that came to my head, so I write it down. Now we've got our options. Impair physical mobility. That's one of the things we wrote, so we're keeping that as possibility. Impair verbal communication. Mm, kind of one we wrote, speech, so we're keeping it. Risk for aspiration. we got to keep that. Perfusion, ineffective cerebral. You cannot, now in your mind, say, oh, 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 yeah, that, that's a possibility. That's what gets you into trouble to begin with. So you have to mark that answer out. You cannot choose it. But now we're down to three that are on our list. What are we supposed to do now? So now you apply that next rule of which of these is most dangerous, which of these is most harmful. So sometimes in a question that's, if you don't do it, what's most harmful? In this case, which of these specific things is most harmful? So impair physical mobility. Okay, yeah, that could be a fall thing, whatever. Impair verbal communication. That's definitely not as risky as falling. Or the next one, risk for aspiration, choking, and un unable to breathe. So mark out impair verbal communication. Then we get to impaired physical mobility versus aspiration. Of those two, which is the most dangerous? Risk for aspiration. So that gives you your answer. Don't you hate it? It always sounds so much easier when I'm explaining it. When you try to do it yourself, it's harder. But it just takes practice. You have to learn to do it this way. All right, changing your answers. Most of the students that do this regularly know they have this problem. They almost always will say, yeah, I always change answers. Well, that means you also have chosen not to fix it. And what I think is the real problem is you really don't realize how big this problem is until you see how many questions you miss because of this. That's why I want you to write, write out those, what the test taking problem is beside the question so you can count them up and if you have three four changing your answers that is in a 50 point exam that's eight percent on your grade that's almost the difference between a letter grade because of changing your answers so I really want you to count that up and see how often you do that the solution is never change your answer 
And I really mean never. Statistically, it works so rarely that we would tell you to never, ever do that. Truly, I know this sounds silly, but if this is a continual problem for you, don't bring an eraser to your exam. I, I'm really not kidding. That's what I do to students that have this problem over and over. If you really aren't sure of the answer, just skip the question. Finish the exam, come back to it, and then put your final answer. Same thing as we talked about last time. You may find something in there that triggers you as you finish the exam, and when you get back to this one, you remember what the answer is. So what I really do for students that have this problem is I give them a little pink eraser, just like you see there, and I write on it, do not use. And I put it right in front of them for every exam as a reminder that this is their problem and they need to quit changing their answers. Overanalyzing. The truth is you can talk yourself into anything, especially on a nursing test, because you have more than one correct answer. And it really is easy for us to talk ourselves into something. So if it's a constant problem for you, use that solution we talked about of down to two answers. Same thing, cover the answers, circle keywords, write what you know. Another thing you might try to do is to try talking yourself out of an answer. It's harder to talk yourself out of it than into it, so it's easier um, to eliminate answers that way, but man, don't ever try to do this till you've practiced this test technique. Don't just try to do it on your nest exam. Practice it on practice questions, questions that are on your computer, or the back of your book, and practice that technique since it's kind of opposite of what most people do. Another thing to remember is if you don't like all of the answer, all of it, you just like most of it, you can't pick it. That answer is wrong if you don't like all of it. And that's a pretty common mistake people make. I don't even know what that is. The problem with this is you, you give up too easily. You choose an answer because you don't, or, or, you choose an answer because you don't know what it is. You figure, oh, that must be the answer. Now, I, that doesn't even make logical sense to me, but I have students do it frequently, and I'll say, why did you pick that? Because you didn't know what that drug was, and they say, yeah, I didn't know what it was, so I figured it must be something I should have known. So I'll tell you a couple things. Make an educated guess, not just a guess. So if the question says, you know, what do you do after percutaneous coronary intervention? A lot of students say, I, I had no idea what PCI was, so I just guessed. But I would tell you, you do know it, even though you think you don't know it. You just give up too easily. So look at these words, percutaneous. What does that make you think of? Skin, under the skin, coronary, heart, intervention. You do something. So this is something you do to the heart under the skin. Well, once you know that, then you can look at those interventions and see if one of them fits a little better instead of just, you know, shaking your finger and say, uh, ABC, I'll just put B. Um, and honestly, if you really know nothing about the subject at all, then look at each answer. And so maybe you know something about the answers. So for example, it says put the head of the bed up. Well, you know that when you put the head of the bed up, that helps people breathe easier. So if that relates, then maybe you can keep that answer. If it doesn't relate, then you can eliminate that. So think about what the answer is really meaning and maybe you can eliminate some that way. Don't just make a guess. I know this answer is right, but I wonder about this other answer. What happens when you do that is that typically leads to you overanalyzing. But most of the time this is really due to lack of confidence. And I really put this in there here because I had one student that I counseled about uh, exams a couple of times. And her biggest problem was she just didn't trust herself. And since she knew that, was, she would say, I know this answer is right, but then I chose the other one. Again, this doesn't make logical sense. If you know an answer is correct, why would you pick something else? that you're not sure of. So listen to yourself. If you know it's correct, don't consider something else. 
you've got to learn to go with your gut if this is your problem and to trust yourself not reading carefully this is a very very common mistake and it happens for a lot of reasons but the way to stop it is to slow down and I, I have no problem with students that take take tests quickly I read fast I took tests quickly but if you're missing a lot of questions because of making dumb mistakes you didn't read carefully you missed keywords then you must force yourself to slow down whether that is to circle or underline keywords in every single question whether that's to read through the test a second time whether it's to start at the back and move forward it doesn't matter to me how you do it but you have to slow yourself down if you do this frequently another very common area where you don't read carefully is on questions that ask for most effective or least effective or they say needs additional teaching or training or what shows you had effective teaching and training please take the time to circle that phrase and then write the word negative or positive or true or false out beside the phrase even sometimes they're underlined already and even if they're underlined if you don't take the time to write true or false negative or positive beside it you still are prone to forget what I was asking for because if it's asking for a negative statement a false statement as soon as you see something true you forget they were asking for something false and you pick it and then when I'm evaluating a test with you you say oh I didn't notice that was a false statement I took the one that was the true thing so you know you just hate to make these mistakes because you knew the answer you just got to move in too fast so the secret is slow yourself down anxiety I talk about this on the test taking tips uh, video so this is really just a quick review but one thing I would tell you is if you Take the time to make sure you're not making any of the previously mentioned test taking problems. Then your anxiety may be resolved because if you're making a common mistake and you can change that, you don't have to be anxious about your exams anymore. The other thing that will really help you is to be sure you're prepared. Prepared. We're much more anxious when we know we haven't studied enough and we know we didn't know the material very well or whatever. That is going to increase your anxiety. So I'll just quickly run through, but I go over this in a little more detail on test taking tips. Wear earplugs if you're easily distracted. Uh, ask to sit at the front of the room or over to one side if you're easily distracted by people getting up and moving around. If you get freaked out because you worry about time, start at the back of your test and work back towards the front or start in your favorite subject area and work from there. It just kind of tricks your mind if you're really worried. You know, Some people think a test gets harder as you go on, so starting at the back sometimes helps you get rid of that fear. If you have a documented learning disability like um, distraction, you know, ADHD, or true test anxiety this document with the doctor let the school know sometimes you can get extra time you can be allowed to take your test in a different location whatever but nobody can give you that extra stuff if you don't let us know you have that problem and too many times students wait until they failed three or four exam or even failed the course before they say oh well I have ADHD and I think that's the problem we can't fix it if we didn't know that at the beginning and then if your doctor has told you you should take medicine for anxiety um, maybe only before a test please try it because so many times students will say gosh I don't want to be on any medicine but nursing school is really stressful for a lot of people and it's just a period of time try it it may actually make you feel a whole lot better and relieve some of that fear when you come to take a test a few cautions any of these tips so let's say you figure out that you're always getting caught by distractors practice the tip for distractors on NCLEX style practice questions before actually implementing them on an exam you don't want to go into an exam and try to practice covering your answers and taking the 
just that way without having practiced that before. That can just really increase your anxiety. So practice it on those. Now those NCLEX practice exams certainly may not be as hard, but still practice that technique and see if it works. I've even had students come in and I let them practice doing that on a previous exam. Kind of try to take the exam in my presence on a previous exam with these tips and see if it makes them feel better. Also, please don't try to apply all of these tips. Don't say, oh gosh, these are all great ideas, so I'm just going to do all of them. It defeats the purpose. Figure out what your primary test taking problem is and fix that. And then if you develop another test taking problem, you can fix that, but just focus your efforts on fixing the one that's your problem. And then you may find you don't fail any more exams after that and you're good. As always, we uh, welcome your feedback and we really ask for your feedback so we can make improvements. Uh, let me know what subjects you want as a nursing student. I mean, I, I'm here to help you. I know things that students ask me frequently, but that's the kind of videos I want to create. So feel free to comment below. Feel free to ask questions. I'd love for you to rate our videos, share our videos, and then subscribe to our YouTube channel so you'll be the first to see new videos that are coming out. If you like this video, you also might like our test taking tips video um, and learning styles video that will be coming out. And then watch for more videos, hopefully on MedSearch topics and even an app coming soon. Thanks for watching.